Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. We're here today with our second host call of the weekend. This is episode 2375. So if you'd like to read along with the questions, you can do so just by heading on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2375. All right, we're about to dive into six more questions here today. I'm excited to see what the community um, has to say, what they may be dealing with, and uh, how I can help to the best of my ability. So I'm opening up the document right now, scrolling past yesterday's show, which was 2374. And we are here today with our first question from Eve. Eve says, Hi, Dr. Brawl. Thanks for answering my question. I've always struggled with belly fat. The rest of me is thin, but I have lower belly fat and love handles. No matter what I do, I can't get rid of it. I eat incredibly well, alternate between strength and cardio days, fast for approximately 16 hours. I definitely do not overeat, perhaps sometimes undereat when I'm having busy days. My only thought is that it could be hormonal. I've just taken out my IUD that I've had for six years or something to do with stress levels. Any advice you would have is greatly appreciated. Been trying to find the answer since I was 10 years old. All right. Well, I'm happy to help. Uh, This is one of the things that we specialize in is helping people transform their bodies the healthy way. And so, Typically, when you're holding fat around the belly, it has to do with increased levels of cortisol or lower thyroid levels combined with dysregulated blood sugar. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but they really do all work together. So what happens is um, you might be high or low in blood sugar. Let's say you've been going too long without eating, your blood sugar then levels drop, uh, stress levels increase, you produce more cortisol. Cortisol then uh, increases your body's ability to break down stored glycogen, raising those blood sugar levels, but yet you're not actually active doing anything. So as the levels increase, uh, your body thought, or your mind at least, thought there was a perceived stress. Since there is no perceived stress, it can then be stored again as body fat or stored for the first time as body fat. And low thyroid um, is is part of this because the higher the cortisol levels and stress levels go, the lower the thyroid levels go. So I have a whole podcast on all things weight loss. Um, I would definitely check that out. But if you really want to go in depth and like find the answer, and this is all free, I just remember this off the top of my head. Go to stephencabral.com forward slash BMRI, bioregulatory uh, medicine. Uh, bioregulatory, B-R-M-I, let's see if that's right. Bioregulatory Medicine Institute. There it is. Okay. So stephencabral.com forward slash B-R-M-I. I recorded this for uh, the Bioregulatory Medicine Institute, which I'm on the advisory board for. I don't receive any compensation. They're just a nonprofit. They do good work. And so I try to share that with them. Okay. So that is that. I would definitely check that out. And um, 100%, this is either most likely hormonal-based or it's digestive-based. And so the very best thing that you could do is run the big five labs. You've got a personalized protocol with that. Um, And if you don't want to run the big five, I would run the stress mood and metabolism test, which looks at all the hormones. That includes uh, estrogen dominance, high cortisol, thyroid, et cetera. Uh, But I would if possible, run the candida metabolic and vitamins test along with it to get your answers. And again, lots of free podcasts at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts. Uh, As you go to the uh, top of that page right there, I'm looking at it. At least it says weight loss solutions. And I have all free podcasts just on how to lose weight the healthy way and keep it off. All right. Angie's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I have had H. pylori and I'm healing gastritis due to that. I used to drink one cup of coffee in the morning, but I haven't done that in over two years. I started drinking bio coffee, which ingredients are instant Arabica coffee powder, non-dairy creamer, which is glucose syrup from tapioca starch, and vegetable fat from palm kernel, uh, oligosaccharides from chicory roots, and wheatgrass powder. It's supposed to be alkaline and is the only coffee that doesn't hurt my throat and stomach. I actually feel better, and it's the only coffee... I think that says it twice, or I just am reading it twice. I actually feel better throughout the day if I drink it. Ideally, it would be the best. I never drank coffee or processed foods, but I'm curious to hear your review. Okay, so, well, um, wheatgrass powder is certainly more alkaline. I just did a whole podcast on this, though, because I just am not always, not always, I'm just saying this right now, not always the biggest fan of instant coffees because oftentimes they can be higher in acrylamides. I'm not saying this coffee is higher in acrylamides. However, 
Samar, uh, and you're actually e getting that that being in there. So again, I just don't know. Um, an alkaline version of this could be a cold brew, and you can cold brew decaf coffee if you'd like as well. But what I would do is I would go to this podcast. Just came out uh, well after you asked this question, which you asked this the end of April. And uh, let's see here. It was episode 2365, all right? So it was last Thursday. Head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2365. The other thing that you could also do is make your own alkaline coffee, if you choose to, <clears throat> by simply adding a little bit of baking soda or baking powder. Both of those are very alkaline. Uh, that would make it alkaline. If you want to do something healthier, uh, you before you drink your coffee, you would drink the alkalizing vitamin C by Equalife. Then at least you get vitamin C and you get calcium, magnesium, and potassium uh, as well. All right. So that's that. Anonymous is up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I'm a fairly new follower, but I wanted to thank you for all you do. I listen to your podcast every day and I enjoy learning about the wide array of topics that you talk about. My question on is on behalf of my partner. He's extremely heavy sweater at night to the point where I feel like I need to wash the sheets every day. He's 29, Vata body type, not overweight, uh, working to implement less red meat and more vegetables in his diet. He's pretty active, but does not work, but does work out with weights two to three times a week. Uh, runs a few times a week as well. The only thing he does enjoy is beer and drinks around three to four daily. Other than that, he's a pretty healthy guy. I have tried to look for what the sweating could be at night, mostly find information on menopausal women. I was wondering if you had any suggestions for things to look into, test to run for the cause of his nighttime sweating. All right, well, um, you said he's not overweight. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, and he's trying to do less red meat and more vegetables diet. Okay, that's good. But it also tells me that he's probably doing maybe a lot of uh, meat in his diet. Maybe, maybe not. Again, I just have to look at this overall because what happens at night, your body is looking to get into hibernation. I mean, it's the best way to think about sleep. It really is. Like your body's hibernating overnight and I, I'm over, oversimplifying this. But the first half of the night is basically repairing the body and the second half of the night is repairing the brain. That is that is not uh, exactly what's going on, but I just like to break it down more simply because more deep sleep is happening in the beginning of the night and more REM sleep is happening at the end of the night. So you need both. Uh, and so your body is essentially rejuvenating and recovering overnight. I would do this anonymous. I would have him say, hey, can you go one week just normal work, normal exercise, normal meals, but no alcohol. And if he is not sweating then or sweating nearly as much on the nights that he does not drink, um, no other variable, okay, can't, you can just do water, but no, no beer, no uh, any alcohol. If he's not, it's an alcohol detox process and his body is just trying to detox that alcohol overnight, which is not uncommon by any stretch of the imagination. Then what you could do for your next um, birthday, anniversary, holiday, whatever you're getting each other gifts, if you are, uh, try to get this individual, your partner, uh, a aura ring or bio strap or some biometric uh, device or whoop strap that you are actually looking at deep sleep and REM sleep and then check it out on the nights that he drinks and the nights that he doesn't drink. So try to start intermittent fasting three or four hours before bed, uh, no alcohol before bed, no snacks before bed, and uh, and try that out. I'd be, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your results from that because uh, it very well could be a detox-based issue. He can also take the, um, uh, which I recommend everybody do, the toxicity quiz over at stephencabral.com forward slash assessments. Everybody should take that quiz to see where they're at in terms of their how full their rain barrel is. All right, Anonymous is up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I had a question about niacin. Growing up, my mom had told me that Getting too much niacin, especially for a female, was not good for your health. However, if I take the DNS powder and they activated B-complex each day, I would consume well over the recommended daily intake of niacin. My mom doesn't specifically remember why she thought taking too much niacin was bad, so I figured I'd ask you. In my research, I did not find that pregnant women need to be... I did find that pregnant women need to be careful with niacin intake, but couldn't find any information on any health risks for non-pregnant individuals. Any insights would be appreciated. Thank you. All right. Great question, Anonymous. So here's the thing. The recommended daily allowance is just to keep you literally from getting things like rickets and scurvy and disease-based states. It is not optimal by any stretch of the imagination, nor do they say it is. It's just you have to be above this level or you could end up with 
some type of disease. So that's not optimal. I will tell you this. I mean, you can do too much of anything, by the way. Like you can do too much of any supplement. There's no doubt about it. You know, I don't believe in mega dosing. However, the B vitamins that we're talking about here, this is vitamin B3, niacin, helps with the brain. It helps your mitochondria. When people talking about uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, nicotinamide riboside, you're talking about B3 is the precursor for that. You're talking about vitamin B3. Um, check out my podcast I've done um, on Dr. Linus Pauling's work, on Dr. Andrew Saul's work, on niacin being used for depression and anxiety, uh, people using it for niacin flush in a sauna, which I'm not recommending. But um, you can take a really high dosage of niacin, and it's um, totally fine for most people. Now, I have to give you my disclaimer. I cannot give you any medical advice, medical treatment plans, medical cures, or diagnose any disease. So if you're dealing with a disease and you're worried about niacin, well, then don't overdo niacin. I can tell you that in the activated B complex, the DNS powder, uh, at least for the people we use it with, there's, it's not even close to upper limits, like without a doubt. Now, everything, by the way, is basically contraindicated for pregnancy, right? We just say that because we don't want to do too much because you're growing a another life inside of your body. So I am the same way. I'm like, no herbs during pregnancy. Um, you've got your daily activated multi or your daily nutritional support or whatever prenatal you want to use, extra methylfolate, right? At least during the first trimester and before you're getting pregnant. Omega-3s wouldn't be a bad idea to help with uh, neural tube defect and a few others. Um, and then you may need iron, which most women do during the uh, last trimester. And then you can decide if you want to get that through uh, whole food iron sources, uh, or you want to do that through whole food uh, nutritional supplement sources. All right. So hopefully that was helpful. All right. Stacy's up next. Hello, Dr. Dr. Brawl. You have been a beacon of light and hope to me. Thank you, Stacy. Appreciate that. I have been suffering for 15 years with extremely strange symptoms. My first symptom was SVT on my daughter's first birthday. My heart rate was around 240. SVT, by the way, for everybody out there listening, super ventricular tachycardia, uh, which unfortunately I had when I was 22 years old, uh, not ideal. And um, so basically heart rate was super high, um, had to get an ambulance that took 10 minutes of uh, trying to control it, get it down, um, continued with catheter ablation to my heart in 2007. Basically it means they were cauterizing Stacy's heart. Uh, soon after symptoms popped up, Numbness in my chin, chin, left leg, weakness in the legs, brain fog, uh, sensory overload. Haven't been able to go to a movie, family gathering, B-Day party, any event without alcohol to calm my nervous system. I don't drink, and it's shameful, and I'm not an alcoholic. I will actually throw up from the sensory overload and the feeling of what I think seizures would feel like. Uh, it's unbearable to say the least. Zero family history of this. MS has been ruled out. My doctors have not been able to diagnose me with anything except SVT, Raynaud's um, mast cell activation syndrome, and now POTS dysautonomia in 2018. These last four years have been my absolute worst. I'm afraid I'm going to die. I am now on Xanax and Plaquenil. Uh, do, you, do you think your program would help? I've had breast implants plants since 2006, hernia mesh, and amalgams. Okay, so, you know, uh, again, I have lots of podcasts on uh, what to do first, because this is a what to do first, you know, situation, right? So first thing you do is please read the book, The Rain Barrel Effect. If you read the book, The Rain Barrel Effect, the next step for most people is in this situation where there's so many things that could be wrong, we run the big five labs, okay? Um, if you can't run the big five labs, the next best thing is the starter kit, and it's uh, like a quarter of the price, or it's it's somewhere around a quarter of the price, okay? And then... And by the way, you can run this with your local naturopathic doctor, your integrative health practitioner. I'm okay with that. I'm just giving you the options. Um, and then what they'll probably do is have you do a functional medicine detox to begin to empty your rain barrel. Again, I can't give you any medical advice, but this is what might happen. And then you'll be, a, you'll be on a specific protocol uh, that will help to rebalance your body. All right, so... Um, Superventricular tachycardia, it can happen from stress. Uh, it can absolutely happen from too high histamines. It can happen from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. It happened to me because I was using uh, or used a nutritional supplement that used to be legal called um, ECA, ephedrine, caffeine, and aspirin. I was 22 years old, working as a personal trainer, and um, and obviously learning about nutritional supplements. And this product 
worked. It worked for fat loss. That's why people used it. And it sped up your heart rate. But me, I, my body was not balanced. I had dysautonomia. I had POTS. I had mass cell activation syndrome. So it just put my heart rate to like 200 beats per minute. I had to go to the hospital too. Um, I was only 22. I didn't have any money. I walked to the hospital and um, it took, took them a couple hours to, to get it back down. Not ideal. Needless to say, sometimes we learn things the hard way. I never used that product again. And uh, that product was subsequently outlawed, banned, um, probably like a year or two later. But not ideal. So we have to be careful, right? We have to be careful because, and that's why, I mean, I do so much third-party testing right now. Well, not so much. Every single product is third-party tested. So it's tested when it comes in the manufacturer and it's tested when it goes out uh, for potency and quality. And um, I only use uh, healthy you know, products. But again, I was 22 years old. And uh, when we're 22 years old, sometimes we don't necessarily think things through fully. And, and I was uh, certainly uh, at fault with that. But as I say, we all make mistakes, but we have to learn from them. So I learned from that mistake. All right, for you, something is triggering this accelerated heart rate. Cortisol, norepinephrine, uh, we want to figure out what is going on with the body, right? So that's, that's where we start. All right, last question today is from Megan. Megan's saying, hi, Stephen, I have two questions for you. What extent does diet outweigh exercise? If I only ate super clean and my exercise regime consisted of a light walk and gentle yoga every day, would I lose muscle tone or would I retain light tone? In your opinion, what should I typically be eating like for a day vegetarian? Can you please provide some recipes? Okay. So uh, yes to both. So the first one is this. Um, diet in the short term dramatically outweighs exercise. Meaning like if you want to lose weight, you don't need to exercise. And, and again, I came from a background of personal training, fitness, strength and conditioning, nutrition, like all those different things. So like I get it and I don't recommend that. But I work with, I've worked with plenty of people and they're not going to exercise. But they do a 21-day functional medicine detox and lose like 10 to 14 pounds, 10 to 15 pounds. 21 days, no exercise, just some walking. That's it. So, you know, if you want to lose weight, nutrition trumps uh exercise. However, over time, you're going to lose muscle and you means you're going to lower your metabolism. So you can't have one without the other. Immediate results, nutrition. Long-term results, exercise. You can't not keep your nutrition tight. You have to, because to be honest, like you can't out train a bad diet. You just can't. So if I were to exercise like I exercise now, which is like five days a week, uh, cause I love exercise. And, um, well, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say I love exercise. I love going to the gym. I don't love cardio, but I do it. So, and that's because it's, <laughs> there's health benefits to it. So let's say I'm doing that. Okay. So if I ate 5,000 calories a day, I would be overweight. Not, it doesn't matter. I mean, I could never out exercise that. I just don't burn that many calories in a day. So there, there is a part to that. All right. And the last part is, um, there's a podcast called day in the life of my Mediterranean diet. And it tells you exactly how you can eat on a vegetarian based diet. Um, I put in a non vegan based protein in the evening, but you can just, you know, have a uh, chickpeas, lentils, mung beans, dal, uh, hummus, hemp hearts, like there's so many different varieties to choose from, right? So there's that. And then we have so many recipes at Cabral support group.com. There's over 100. So all you have to do is just say, uh, well, actually, just go to cabralsupportgroup.com, use the search bar, type in recipes, and you'll see all sorts of delicious plant-based recipes there as well because we help people that are vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, lacto-ovo, primal, paleo, doesn't matter to us. We're going to help you either way, all right? So thank you, everyone, for writing in on these questions today. They were fantastic, as always. Can't wait to chat it with you again, though, tomorrow on our Mindset and Motivation Monday. Talk with you then.